Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. We're trying to collect as much information as we can to ensure that the resource is available today, tomorrow, and 100 years from now. And if we can get our bob white populations to stabilize, we ought to be able to help those other species that are never hunted or never going to be. If you're hunting with another person, be very careful to never cross into that person's safe zone of fire. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. They look prehistoric. They're awesome looking fish. Lots of teeth. They're something that would be dreamt up as a monster in a Hollywood movie, but the truth is they're just not such monsters. They get a bad rap a lot. Have a good life. It's late spring on the Trinity River between Dallas and Houston. That's basically it. Fishing guide Dawson Hefner is on the hunt for alligator gar. We're looking to get something over six foot here today. But catching a gargantuan gar first requires catching some smaller fish. That's a haul. That's the easy part. Are you keeping these? Yeah. With bait on board, the gar anglers head down river to try their luck. Y'all ready? As far as uh, rod and reel angling for alligator gar, most people give you a strange look when you tell them that's what you do. Uh, they just look at you dumbfounded like, uh, really? Along with Dawson on this gar quest is his friend Jason. I've always felt like uh, a game fish is what people tell you you should catch, but a sport fish is what you want to catch. So I definitely consider a sport fish. Jason once landed a gar here that was bigger than him. My personal best is six feet, seven inches. I like catching all different species, and the bigger, the better. Jason's friend John is also an experienced angler, but he has never fished for alligator gar. They get to such huge size in, in the freshwater environment of Texas. I think most people don't realize how large they get, and really what an exciting adventure would be to, to catch one. In Texas waters, the long nose, short nose, and spotted gar can all be found. But the alligator gar grows the largest of all, with catches weighing as much as 300 pounds. Eight feet is not uncommon. Hopefully a hungry fish will come through here and find it. Though trophy-sized gar can be caught around the state, the Trinity River is known as one of the best alligator gar fisheries in the world. No, no, no. Though you might not guess that today. We're having a pretty slow day here so far. We've been set up on this spot for about an hour and a half, haven't had any runs. It's looking like we may need to move and see if we can find some more active fish somewhere else. People don't travel the Trinity River. I don't think it's publicized or promoted at all, but there's a lot of natural beauty here, tranquility, and uh, just the absence of people. I'm a people person, but uh, not when it comes to fishing. <laughs> the fewer people, the, the, the more plentiful the fish, I think. The crew finds another promising sandbar on a bend in the river and serves up a variety of cut bait. Rod alarms will signal a bite, so there's only one thing to do. There is a lot of waiting involved. But they haven't waited for long when there's some action on the furthest rod. Something is taking this one. Some days there's actually enough activity that you don't get to relax because you get to run back and forth the rods most of the day. He let go. That'll keep us going for several more hours for sure. We're getting closer. <laughs> As catching gar has become the focus of more anglers, Studying them has become a focus of fisheries biologists. Historically, no one really cared about them, no one really right. fished for them, yep. so the managers didn't really spend time collecting data on them either. That meant little was known about the lives of alligator gar, but biologists Dan Dougherty and Chris Bodine are changing that through studies like this one on Choke Canyon Reservoir. Anglers have gotten much more interested in, in fishing for alligator gar, hook and line, as well as bow fishermen. 
the increase in popularity obviously is putting greater pressure on our populations. We've got a fish on already. Hopefully it's a gar. Texas is home to the best populations of alligator gar left in the United States. Yeah, and we want to keep them that way. The only way to do that is to collect data one gar at a time. We get fish in the boat and uh, uh, you always want to be a little bit careful around the head because it is full of teeth. But the cool thing about it is that they're overall a pretty docile creature. They just simply want to get back into the water. So we tag the fish with two different tag types. An internal tag called a pit tag. And we also tag them with an external tag. If an angler catches that fish, he can call the number that's on the tag and report that catch to us. 451. And that's very important information for an idea of harvest rates. 1439. Length and maximum girth. We also take a genetic sample. 585. Once a fish is released, rinse and repeat. Oh, they are full of slime. Nets are reset, scanned for fish, Big splash. and retrieved. It's buffalo central today. Freshwater drum. Unfortunately, they catch right. anything big that swims by. Not quite the right kind, but we are catching fish. <clears throat> by the end of the day, Dan and Chris have caught only four alligator gar. Definitely don't want that dude in our gill net. But they do feel lucky to have not caught an alligator or the other toothy creature they spy on the lake as they pull in their nets. What is that? Is that a rattlesnake? Dude, it is a rattlesnake. Look at him stick his head up like that. I've never seen one. Rattlesnakes in the water. Now I can say I've seen it all. That's gotta be an alligator gar. The next day of research has a slow start. Negative. Only one gar by mid-afternoon. But after hours of looking, they find the fish. They're surfacing like crazy, so. Oh, that was a big splash. This is gonna be exciting. Moments after being set, two nets are full of gar. Little guy. Easy, easy. Watch your legs. Soon, the boat is jumping. Okay. Lord, mercy. It's kind of like the angler coming out to fish. Some days the crappie bite, some days they don't. They must work fast for all the fish to survive. It's amazing, it's amazing. Done? Yes, sir. Come on, buddy, play nice. 14 fish in five minutes. That's gar fishing at its finest there. It's a big contribution to the research. Bye, baby. And it's a sure sign that catching big gar has a lot to do with being in the right place at the right time. Back on the Trinity River, timing has not been right for John, Jason, and Dawson. Dadgummit. In spite of getting some bites and fishing all night, they have not landed a gar. By morning, they have other problems. We've got thunderstorms on the way in and it's already started to rain, so unfortunately we won't be able to fish any more today. But determination has them back on the water in three weeks. The weather is clear, and this time Dawson has some added support. My wife's along today for good luck. See if that won't help straighten things out. It seems to help. Within minutes of the first cast, there's a fish on the line. Real, 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 real. Strength, this massive strength. It's a challenge, and I, I enjoy a challenge. Ah, he's a fighter. Woo! -hoo! It's a lot of work but it's a lot of fun. Adrenaline rush you get, it's totally worth it. Oh, this is great. Not a bad fish to start the day. My first one, <laughs> outstanding. All right, if I can just get back up the bank with right? <laughs> These are good four, four and a half feet long, would be my guess. I certainly want a photo of that one. Be good, fish. <laughs> we haven't seen a giant gator guard today, but, uh, you know, they're still fun to catch. All right, away he goes. While this fish story comes to an end, to the story of alligator gar angling may be just beginning. It does seem like they become more popular each year. A face only a mother could love. <laughs> With anglers and biologists taking care to protect these fish, gargantuan gar should always have a home in Texas waters. Had a great time. 
People travel from all over the world to fish for these fish, and uh, there's not a lot of other experiences like it. Our mission is to preserve Texas' wild quail hunting heritage for this and future generations. Why wild? If you've ever hunted pin-raised quail, uh, I, I tell people it's like kissing your sister. There's better things. The Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch is 4,700 acres of the best quail habitat in Texas. And there's a reason for that. Everything done here focuses on one species. <whistles> The intrigue, the uh, challenge of quail hunting revolves around the dogs and the wing shooting skills with wild birds because they fly about 50% faster than what any pin raid quail would fly. Quail are the most imperiled game bird in Texas. Their survival means the survival of small towns like Roby and landowners like Buddy Baldridge. People come from all over the country and out of the country to come to this part of the world to, to hunt quail. Not only do they bring money for the lease, they stay in motels, they eat in restaurants, buy groceries, gasoline, the whole works. One of our biggest conservation challenges right now because all of our grassland songbirds are basically doing this, the same trajectory as the Bob White. So the Bob White acts as a barometer, as a canary of the prairie, and if we can get our Bob White populations to stabilize, we ought to be able to help those other species that are never hunted or never gonna be. They're riding on the piggyback of the Bob White. In 2003, an idea was hatched to help save the species a place dedicated to study every factor that impacts quail abundance. About three months later, the Mellon Foundation came up with the funds to acquire the ranch, and so the rest is history. That history includes a lot of land management techniques. Aldo Leopold once said that the same tools that were used to destroy wildlife habitat, he named those as the ax, the plow, the cow, the fire, and the gun, could be used to restore game populations. We take that to heart here at the Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch. The ranch acts as a demonstration site, showcasing water harvesting like these spreader dams. Some people call them speed bumps. They're just a way of diverting water from, that would have been lost to runoff off the road into a little area about the size of a swimming pool. But it also makes little bugging areas for, for insects. And quail, quail chicks especially, like to eat those little insects. The beautiful thing about this place is it's more about science and showing people. Uh, so we can try things that, uh, that might not you know, be effective for other ranchers to try, and we're not afraid to fail. If you can do it and think of it, you know, chances are we've either done it or are gonna do it. Studies have shown that wild quail held for several days prior to the release have better survival rates and are less likely to disperse. Well, we're taking birds from points further west and moving them back to points further east that used to have quail, but they don't have quail anymore. They have built it, but the birds didn't come. Some of the research that we've done is, for example, put GPS collars on coyotes. The coyotes are not that great a predator of Bob White's. In fact, less than 1% of their diet consists of quail. In the early 1990s, Dale established the Texas Brigades, inspiring teenagers to become wildlife ambassadors on behalf of everything from deer to bobwhite. It's not just a camp about quail. Behind the scenes, it's more of a leadership, teaching them about the biology, health of the rangeland, teaching them plants. What the heck is plant succession? What the heck is plant succession? Hello, hello, Bob White Brigade! Hello, hello. I forgot the other verses. And if folks can't come to the research ranch, Dell takes his message to them. Dr. Dale on quail, bringing you the latest news and views about all things quail in Texas. <laughs> with a podcast, Facebook, and a website, quailresearch.org. I'd like to think that 10 years from now, that indeed we served as the Alamo of quail conservation in West Texas. If the decline stopped here, we, we found remedies, we found tips that would allow other ranchers and landowners to maintain their quail populations. As a steward of this property, it's not my property, but I treat it like it is, I love it, 
and I'd spend every day of the rest of my life up here if I could. Hi, I'm Heidi Rayo, Hunter Education Specialist with Texas Parks and Wildlife. Let's talk about safe zones of fire while hunting. When hunting in a group, each hunter has a safe zone of fire. This is an area where you can safely take a shot. If you shoot beyond your safe zone of fire, this could have dangerous or deadly results. It's easy to find your safe zone of fire. Start by focusing on an object ahead of you like a tree. Hold your thumbs up and slowly bring them to the side of your body until your thumbs disappear out of vision. This is about a 45 degree angle and the area where you can safely take a shot. This is your safe zone of fire. It's that easy. If you're hunting with another person, be very careful to never cross into that person's safe zone of fire. In fact, no matter how many hunters there are, even one hunter, you should never swing outside of your 45 degree safe zone of fire. Another thing to think about is target fixation. When a bird flushes, you can easily forget about your surroundings and your safe zone of fire. If you're excited and only focusing on your target, you can quickly lose track of your safe shooting zone. You can even lose sight of buildings and roadways. This is very dangerous. Bottom line, don't let target fixation override your sense of safety. Firearm safety is your responsibility. So, always be aware of your safe zone of fire, even when you're excited. We always want to enjoy safe and memorable hunts. These folks are attending a memorial for Ethel. She died in 1994 at the age of 19. Ethel was a largemouth bass, and if you've never heard of her, you may be wondering, why all this fuss for a fish? Why would a thousand people come to pay their respects? As USA Today wrote, what exactly did Ethel do to become immortalized? The answers start here in Lake Fork. It's where Ethel was spawned and where fishing guide Mark Stevenson put her on the fast track to fame. A big cold front had come through and we were just going down the, the side of a creek. I reached down, picked up my rod, made one pitch in there, boom. Brought her to the boat, netted her, and uh, that was it. I mean, it was just... Ray Sasser was talking to him. He said, what are you gonna call that fish? It's ready to go. And I thought for a minute and it just popped in my head, Ethel. <laughs> Every Ethel that I'd ever known had been uh, kind of on the stocking side. And if you've ever seen a picture of Ethel, she was as big around as she was long. Years before Ethel and Mark hooked up, the origins of a radical new program called Sherlunker had already spawned. Recognizing these big fish were too precious just to let die, a primary goal of the program was to foster a catch and release mentality among anglers. 3317, that's a good one. Equally ambitious was a plan that would dramatically improve the genetics of bass raised in hatcheries. 360. Ethel had come along at a time tailor-made to transform a mega bass into a mega star. And you gotta remember the time, 1986. The whole picture of bass fishing was completely different than what it is now. Back before 86, bass fishing was a primarily fish caught for food. People kept the big fish and released the little fish. 
And we realized that the, the, the larger fish were, were so valuable that we had to change the direction from a consumptive sport to recreation. And when Ethel came on the scene, we began to realize that we could raise these big fish. And from that day on, uh, Texas became known as a mecca for big bass. The lure of the big fish worked. It gave a lot of validity uh, of a fish that big of what the Parks and Wildlife was doing to further the fishing in Texas and the big fish. See the big one over on the bed? And the consciousness of catch and release showed that you could grow and manage a fishery and have truly big fish. My memories of Ethel. At that point in time, we were trying to breed a bigger bass. And they were saying that a state record had been caught. Ethel just dropped in out of the blue. The first Cheryl Lunker entered into the program. I mean, the program just went from zero to 100 miles an hour just because of that one fish. We could take the fish to Tyler, where we would take care of it and possibly try to spawn it. And it was a uh, very quiet trip most of the way home. The gravity of what we were doing, it kind of set into all three of us. Because I think the impact and the significance that this fish could play has begun to seek in. We did not know how we would keep it alive. We'd never done this before. They didn't think that the program would work. But my concern was if this fish died, it may kill the whole program. A lot of the people in the hatchery system didn't think the program would work. This fish did not eat for a long time. We can't let this fish die. And I spent hours at night with a sunfish or something on a string and dangling it in front of her, and she just sort of sitting there looking at it, not paying any attention to it. We had no idea what impact that fish would have, not only on parks and wildlife inland fisheries, but on our lives as well. I'm the director of the Fisher Center, and the Fisher Center would not be here, I don't believe, if we had not had Ethel in the program and kept her alive. When a Cheryl Lunker is entered into the program, we bring it over here to the Texas Freshwater Fishery Center. And their eyes look clear for now. First thing we do is examine the fish. We make sure that it's in good condition to spawn. At which point, we'll then insert a, a microchip called a pit tag, which has a number, which we can identify the fish once it's released back into the lake where the angler chooses to release it at. This is what the importance of anglers are to the Texas Parks and Wildlife Fishery Program. Can we produce fish that will encourage people to come in from around the world and enjoy the sport fishing in the state of Texas? Come on, sweetie. All righty. She's back home. But Ethel never did go back home to Lake Fork. She lived out her life here in Springfield, Missouri. But don't feel bad for her. For seven years, she was indulged and idolized by millions of visitors. She was a spotlight to showcase the sport of bass fishing. And that fish was just the most shining example of what can happen if you really manage your resources properly and pay attention and invest in the future. She was an ambassador for the Cheryl Lunker program and all that meant to fishing. It was very inspirational deal, that fish. <laughs> <laughs>